It's now a great pleasure to ask Claire Hopkins from London, United Kingdom, to further go into do biologics make the cut in patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps? Claire, please. Thank you, Professor Backett. That was a fantastic overview of the importance of type 2 inflammation in chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. My name is Claire Hopkins and I'm an ENT consultant at Guy's Hospital in London. I'll be talking about do biologics make the cut in patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. These are my disclosures. We're going to start by considering the patient burden associated with sinonasal surgery for nasal polyps. We're then going to highlight the role of biologics in patients with and without a history of prior surgery. We're going to finish by considering the importance of baseline eosinophils in the management of chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. We know that as nasal polyps become more severe, patients undergo continued treatment with intranasal corticosteroids, saline rinses, but will often need repeated courses of systemic corticosteroids and surgery. Many patients with mild disease can be managed in primary care with intranasal corticosteroids and saline rinses alone. But for those of us working in a hospital setting, we will see mostly patients with moderate to severe disease. These patients will often respond to courses of systemic corticosteroids, but usually only transiently. And a recent Cochrane review has shown that most patients return to baseline within three months of treatment. We're much more aware now of the risk of systemic corticosteroids and their impact both in terms of repeated use or morbidity, but also increased mortality. And therefore we really try to restrict use to a maximum of one or two courses per year. This will mean that patients spend many months of the year uncontrolled with respect to their symptoms. And in these cases, we'll often consider stepping up to sinonasal surgery, both to reduce the polyp load and better open the sinuses to application of topical steroids. But despite this, at least one in five patients will undergo a revision surgery in the first five years. Many patients will put off a return to a further surgery because of fear of going through repeated surgeries, the pain and discomfort and the risk of complications that that involves. So again, we'll spend much of their time being uncontrolled. We therefore see many of our patients with moderate to severe disease going through a cycle of repeated surgery, ongoing medical therapy and courses of systemic steroids, but failing to achieve adequate control of symptoms. We see that after surgery, there's an early recurrence of edema in at least four out of five of our patients as early as six months after their sinonasal surgery. And at this early time point, as many as one in three will already have a frank recurrence of polyps. This isn't associated with a return in their symptoms. First, with an increase in loss of smell as early as six months after surgery, followed by an increase in nasal obstruction and rhinorrhea, such that at 12 to 18 months after surgery, many patients have significant return in their symptom levels. About 40% of patients seen in an academic centre are thought to have uncontrolled symptoms, despite optimum treatment with surgery and medical therapy. It's therefore no surprise that we're turning to alternative treatments using biologics to better control this moderate to severe group. Currently, there are three different biologics approved for use in the US for the management of severe chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, dupilumab, omalizumab and mepolizumab. Both dupilumab and omalizumab are currently approved for use within Europe, and mepolizumab is under consideration. There are a number of other biologics which have recently completed phase three trials or in which studies are ongoing. And these are hopefully become available for treatment in the near future. So we're going to think about how this history of recurrent surgery impacts on the outcome of biologics. For patients presenting to an ENT department for care, at least 50% of them will likely have undergone previous surgery. And it's important to understand whether this will impact the effectiveness of biologics if they're to be given. There are concerns that repeated surgery may cause irreversible scarring in the mucosa, for example, that may impact on the ability to then improve loss of sense of smell. There's also a concern that with longer duration of disease, the response to treatment may be less and perhaps biologics may be less effective in this group of patients. We therefore undertook some post-hoc analyses 
are the data from the Liberty trial, looking at patients treated with 24 and 52 weeks of dupilumab. And actually what's really encouraging to see is that regardless of the number of previous surgeries, patients all improve with regard to nasal polyp score, nasal congestion, and their lumbar chi score, the radiological extent of disease. So here we see for the nasal polyp score, both patients with no previous surgery, but also those with one, two, or three or more surgeries, achieve significant improvements in their nasal polyp score. We see similar results in nasal congestion and lumbar chi. We also looked at the time from the most recent surgery. And interestingly, what we found is that those patients that recur more quickly, those who are within three years from their last surgery, actually derive greater benefit from dupilumab than those that had their last surgery more than 10 years ago, although we see significant improvements in all groups. This is important because this group that derived the least benefit from current standard of care, that is the group that despite previous surgery, systemic corticosteroids get an early recurrence of symptoms and polyp disease, actually seem to derive greater benefit from dupilumab. This is the group that we would consider particularly difficult to treat, but they actually do very well on a biologic again, regardless of the time point or the number of previous surgeries. We see similar changes when we look at the outcomes of loss of sense of smell, the SNOT22 score, and the UPSIT score, a psychophysical test role faction. And again, we see that the number of previous surgeries doesn't seem to impact on the significant benefit achieved with dupilumab. But again, we see a slight trend to suggest that those with the shortest time to recurrence actually achieve greater benefit from dupilumab. This translates into significant reductions in the need for surgery or systemic corticosteroids across all groups, regardless of the number of prior surgeries. So we can be hugely encouraged that all of the patients that we're likely to see with moderate to severe disease, which is uncontrolled on current standard of care, will improve with treatment with the dupilumab, regardless of prior number of surgeries received. Looking at a similar analysis from epilizumab taken from the Synapse study, they found slightly different results in that those patients that had had more than two surgeries didn't seem to benefit in terms of improvement of sense of smell, whereas those that had had only one surgery did achieve some improvement in sense of smell with an improvement of two points on a visual analogue score of 10. So to conclude this section, dupilumab improves quality of life scores, reduces nasal polyp score, congestion and sinus opacity, regardless of the number of previous surgeries. In contrast, mepolizumab was only found to improve loss of smell in patients who had had fewer previous surgery, and this benefit was lost in those that had two or more. When we think about that group that have greatest benefit who recurred within three years, it leads us to question what the underlying mechanism may be. Traditional teaching is that a higher eosinophil count in the polyp tissue predicts a higher rate of recurrence and an earlier time to recurrence. So when we look at this group, are we simply selecting out those with higher levels of baseline eosinophils? And does this predict response to treatment? We've heard in the first lecture about the importance of eosinophils in the pathophysiology of type two inflammation and nasal polyps. And again, this slide reminds us that they're elevated in patients with nasal polyps compared to those without nasal polyps, but with chronic rhinosinusitis and to healthy controls. And therefore, it may be obvious to assume that this is the reason that we're getting better responses and perhaps looking at eosinophils will predict those good responders to biologic therapies. This data, however, really led us to question whether that's true. Treatment with a drug called dexpramipexily, which depletes eosinophils, surprisingly did not achieve significant changes in nasal polyp score. This is an open label study undertaken by Tanya Laidlaw. And what you can see after six months of treatment, 95% of the eosinophils and tissues had been depleted. However, there was no change at all in the nasal polyp score in this group of patients. And this has really led us to question whether eosinophils play such a central role in the pathophysiology of nasal polyps after all. Perhaps these drugs that we see effective are working on other cells in the inflammatory response. The synapse study looked at whether eosinophil levels predicted response to mepolizumab. There was a very small number of patients with a baseline eosinophil count of less than 150, so it's difficult to draw any strong conclusions from this group. But in the remaining patients, stratifying according to baseline eosinophil count didn't appear to predict response 
both in terms of improvement in nasal polyp score or nasal obstruction, although there is perhaps a slight trend to greater improvements with a nasal polyp score reduction of one point and those with an eosinophil count of more than 300, compared to those where it was over 150 but less than 300. We undertook a similar post hoc analysis for the data from the Liberty studies for dupilumab, and we tried to classify patients according to the GESREC criteria for eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis. This is a scoring system that looks at the blood eosinophil level, the CT scores, and then stratifies patients as to whether they have asthma or non steroidally exacerbated respiratory disease. And this allows us to classify our patients into either severe eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis, moderate, mild, or non-eosinophilic disease. These criteria were applied for the patients that took part in sinus 24 and sinus 52. And this is a slightly complicated slide, but when we look at all patients included in the Liberty studies, what's very clear across all the outcomes is that there is progressive improvement from 24 weeks to 52 weeks. So here you can see that the nasal polyp score continues to improve and reduce, as does the congestion score and the lumbar chi score. And what we found even at 52 weeks in the trial that the improvement appeared to be ongoing and didn't appear to have plateaued. But what we see when we stratify according to eosinophilic disease is there is significant improvement regardless of the baseline eosinophilic status. So even the group with non-eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis achieved significant reductions in their nasal polyp score, congestion and radiological extent of disease. The response is perhaps greater in those with severe eosinophilic disease compared to this group, although the differences are not statistically significant. But here you can see at 52 weeks, there's a three point reduction in those with severe eosinophilic disease, which is almost double that seen in the group with non eosinophilic disease. That trend is perhaps less dramatic with nasal congestion and a little stronger with the Lumma Chi score. Again, when we look at some of our other outcomes, the total symptom score, the UPSIT score, the SNOT22, and the overall VAS score for chronic rhinosinusitis, we see that all patients improve regardless of the underlying eosinophilic status. Again, we see ongoing improvement in many of these outcomes from 24 to 52 weeks. We see significant reduction in the UPSIT score at both time points. There is no significant difference in the changes according to the under underlying eosinophilic status. Though again, we see in some of these outcomes, perhaps a trend to greater improvement in those with the most severely eosinophilic disease. So in summary, dupilumab improved scores for nasal polyps, congestion, radiological extent of disease, loss of smell, total symptom score, quality of life and rhinosinusitis, regardless of the underlying eosinophilic status. Similarly, mepolizumab has been shown to improve nasal polyp scores and nasal obstruction. And again, the under, underlying eosinophilic count doesn't seem to significantly influence the outcomes. Analys analysis of efficacy data stratified by baseline eosinophil count for omelizumab has not been made publicly available in any of the published trials. Overall, it's important to note that dupilumab was well tolerated and there was a very little difference in adverse events between the active group and the placebo. The most common adverse event was injection site reactions. Again, it's only slightly more frequent in the active treatment group compared to placebo. A small number of patients also reported conjunctivitis and arthritis, but generally it's considered safe and well tolerated by patients taking part in the studies. Looking at the European Medical Agency reporting agency, common adverse events included injection site, injection site reaction and site swelling. Similarly, mepolizumab was overall generally well tolerated by patients in the synapse study, again with a low incidence of adverse events, both in the active treatment arm and the placebo treatment arm. European Medicine Agency reporting is not yet available as mepolizumab has not yet been approved for use within Europe for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. Finally, omelizumab was also generally well tolerated, although there was a slightly higher incidence of adverse events reported with headaches in approximately 8% of the population, dizziness, abdominal pain, arthralgia, and our injection site reactions. The most common adverse event reported to the EMA for headaches, dizziness, arthralgia, abdominal pain, and injection site reactions, as shown in the slide. In summary, overall for our talk, we have three biologics, dupilumab, omelizumab, bepolizumab, 
currently approved for use in the US for patients with severe and controlled chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. These have shown to be generally safe and well tolerated. The availability of biologics data in patients with a history of sinonasal surgery or stratified by blood eosinophil levels in the published literature is currently limited, but we've been able to look at some of these today. Patients with chronic rhinosinusitis face a significant burden, both in terms of the initial surgery and in terms of symptom recurrence requiring further revision. What we found in patients with a history of prior surgery was that dupilumab was still able to achieve significant improvements in scores for nasal polyps, congestion, sinus opacity, opacity loss of smell and quality of life. Epilizumab improves loss of smell scores in patients with fewer previous surgeries, but data for omelizumab was not available. Chronic rhinosinusitis is characterized by eosinophils. However, depletion doesn't improve overall nasal polyp scores. But despite stratification with, low, with blood eosinophil count, dupilumab achieves significant improvements across all groups in the outcomes that we've mentioned. Epilizumab was also shown to achieve significant improvements in nasal polyp score and nasal obstruction, regardless of underlying eosinophil data, but this data is not available for omelizumab. Thank you very much for your time and attention.